Hello and welcome to the Couch Lesson number three. My name is Jeanette and I'm working for the Goethe Institute in Munich and I'm very happy to see that so many people from all over the world will join us today and I hope you have yourself made comfortable, maybe on the couch, and that you will spend a pleasant hour with us. Hopefully you enjoyed the music as well. It was music made by Yona. So Yona has been created by the London-based company OxHuman and it is trained using artificial intelligence, fed on music and literature, and learning from reactions to your music posted online. So can AI like Yona take over a deeply human capacity like creativity? This is just one question we want to deal with during our couch lessons. Every week, always on Wednesday, we invite experts from different countries to discuss the risks, the challenges, but also the opportunities presented by developments in the field of artificial intelligence. The couch lessons are funded by the Federal Foreign Office and organized by the Goethe Institute, the worldwide active cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. We promote the study of German language abroad, and we also encourage international cultural exchange. With the Couch Lessons, we want to initiate a discussion outside the technology savvy community. And the Goethe Institute deals with this topic because AI has and it will have a huge impact on our society at different levels and in various fields. AI will contribute to a new revolution in human history. And this fact raises a lot of questions. How intelligent can machines become and can they make fair decisions? Are we threatened by the automation of society through algorithms and AI? Will initially human skills such, such as the creation of art be computerized? Or will AI make the world a better place by helping us solve big problems such as climate change, pandemics, or inequalities? Do we still have to work in the future? And if we don't, what else will we do? As AI shapes our society for better or for worse, it should be on all of us to decide what the direction we will take. The couch lessons are an invitation to find meaning behind technical developments in the field of AI, inspire new ways of thinking and create our collective future. Today we will ask what robots, robots sorry, can and what will they do today and in the future and how they interact with humans. And for the beginning of this couch lessons, we have prepared a poll for you. And maybe my co-host Martin can read them because I cannot right now. Martin, can you read the questions? Sure. So I think everybody can see the questions as well on your screens now. And the first question is, will robots replace humans? Can, and the second one is, can you imagine a robot taking care of you when you're old? And the third one, can you feel for a robot? So can you have feelings for robots? Yeah, and as long as we wait for your answers, I would like to inform you briefly about some guidelines of the couch lessons. First, our two experts will give an input, each about 15 minutes long. And after that, we will open the discussion for all of you. And during the whole time, you can ask questions or contribute your opinions in our chat. And I will go through the chat and pick out some of the questions and thoughts, and then we can discuss them later. I will ask different persons to contribute their questions personally, but if I don't ask you to talk, please turn off your microphone. I also want you to know that the whole event is recorded, but we will just record the persons that are speaking. You can always turn off your video and uh, switch off your microphone, although we would invite you to switch on the video so that we all can see all the participants of this event. And for that, we would recommend to use the gallery view. So let's have a look to the results. And with this, I hand over to my co-host Martin from Sweden, who helped me uh, curating the series and who will moderate it. Thank you very much. So yeah, the, uh, I think you can all see the, the results of the poll. And most of you, 63%, think that robots will replace you in the workplace, uh, but not otherwise. And 
fifty percent, a little bit more than that, can imagine having a robot taking care of you when you are old, and then can you have feelings for a robot? Is a little bit undecisive. Um, so we're gonna share this uh, or take a screenshot of this, and then we will actually ask the same questions again at the very end, and we'll see if if you have different answers to these questions then. So as Jeanette say, my, said, my name is uh, Martin Tönkvist, uh, and I'm a curator and a context maker based in Malmö, Sweden. Uh, and I know that we have participants from all over the world in today's lesson, so if you feel like it, please say hi and type where you're joining in from in the chat. Uh, because even though these sessions online are somewhat common now, I refuse to take the magic of global gatherings for granted. So it's always a beautiful thing to say, to see like Argentina, Sao Paulo, Warsaw, Tel Aviv, Johannesburg, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think it's amazing that the Goethe Institute have a presence all over the world. So thank you very much for showing up. Uh, it's truly amazing to have all of you here. Um, so this morning I was thinking about the questions we're posing in today's couch lesson. And I was thinking about what interactions I'd had with robots in the past week. And in the way my five-year-old son would draw a robot, it's none. Uh, but then I recalled a drive to the countryside and I was driving in a quite ordinary yet new Volvo, of course, since I'm from Sweden, uh, from a carpool that I'm using. And when I was driving with cruise control on, I was poked to turn pilot assist on. And with that on, uh, the car not only keeps distance to the car in front, it also takes over the steering wheel and keeps me in the lane. It's not self-driving per se, and it doesn't look like a robot, but as a driver, it sure felt like it's taking care of itself somehow. And, and also, to be honest, it also feels a bit scary and prompts a lot of questions. So how does this work? Does it work? Uh, why is it making other choices in micromanaging the steering than I would have? and so on. And so there's always been an interface between man and machine in the case of driving, but it's slowly but surely moving from sticks and ladders that I feel in direct control of to a more intelligent and autonomous set of technologies. And although it's not yet fully self-driving, this example made me realize that it's the word interaction that is the one to look out for today if we think about the title of today's session because intelligence machines are a part of our lives and it's but it's up to us to see them acknowledge them and either feel empowered by them or address the problem problems that might arise in our developing relation um, and is this emerging interaction between humans and the increasingly intolerant to technology uh, that this couch lesson is going to to sort of revolve around and with us to explore the potential and complexity, we have two distinguished speakers. We have Professor Sami Haddadin uh, and also Dr. Kate Darling. So let's jump right into it. Our first presenter is Professor Sami Haddadin. He is the director of Munich School of Robotics and Machine Intelligence at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, and he holds the share of robotics and science and systems intelligence. For us, he's going to define what a robot is, give an overview of what they're currently capable of, and also hint to how human-robotic intera interactions develop in the future. Please beam your energy to Sami. Uh, the screen and microphone is, is yours, Sami. Wonderful. Thank you, Martin, for the introduction and also to Jeanette for this wonderful invitation. It's a great honor to be here. And maybe you could just quickly confirm that you guys uh, can hear me well and the screen is shared. Maybe just give me a hint. Great. Awesome. Okay. So um, Martin was basically taking away everything that I'm going to talk about today. At least 50% is going to be about interaction. So uh, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, robots interacting with the world and this being a primary um, thing about robots. And um, I think it's kind of interesting if we really look at um, 
kind of the future that we that we all I guess are, are looking forward to. We all are kind of facing um, a future society that is living about uh, or it's about living with machines, interacting with machines, humans and humans, humans and machines in the future of industry, future of work, mobility, but I guess also in the future of our general society, we can see that these machines, I mean, this is the reason why we can uh, all come together, this wonderful happening that Goethe Institute is, is kind of giving us, um, that uh, these uh, interactive machines are part of our society becoming more and more. Um, however, I think it's kind of interesting if you really look at, um, at the way that um, these uh, big uh, leap forward that we have seen the, the last decades, are being perceived. I mean, we have all seen uh, Google's DeepMind um, beating Lee Sedol, who is sitting here on the right side in the famous um, game Go. He's a grandmaster of, of this very complex game. Um, however, if I, when, I, when I saw this, this was running around the globe in 2016 and really showing what current AI technology is capable of, it was kind of interesting when I saw this picture because you should ask yourself a very distinct question as soon as you, as you look at it. Because there is Lee Sedol sitting on the right side, there is AlphaGo, the machine in the back, doing the computations. However, who the hell is that guy on the left side, right? So interestingly, this person is solely there for executing the steps that the machine is planning and deducing in order to beat Lee Sedol. So when I saw this picture, I was really thinking about my own childhood when I was at high school, because I kind of had the similar experience already. So there was a déjà vu that I basically had. And this was in the year 97, uh, when essentially the same situation happened. Deep Blue was playing chess against uh, Gary Kasparov. Deep Blue was uh, the, the previous uh, Deep Mind. And uh, the company at hand that developed that system was IBM in that time. And we could ask the same question, right? I mean, on the left side, there's Gary Kasparov, but who the hell is the guy on the right side? So obviously, we don't believe that within more than 20 years of research, the only thing we could do is to place a human from the right side to the left side. Um, however, there seems to be, despite all the tremendous uh, efforts and, and advances we have been seeing in, in AI, um, that there seems to be something that we are not uh, entirely uh, capturing here. And if I look at the experiments I typically do with my kids, so I've got three kids and uh, I always let them do all kinds of experiments, especially I call them sensory mode experiments. So this is my eldest daughter when she was around five, five years old. And I was working on, on learning algorithms for robots. So I wanted to give robots the ability to, to grasp the world, interact with it and really manipulate uh, it. And I was thinking about what is a kind of challenging task, but not too challenging so that I can really make some steps forward. And um, the, the great thing with kids is that they create kind of situations in which you can really kind of uh, create uh, reproducible situations, meaning they basically make a big mess every day, right? So we all know that. But this also gives you the incentive to create some experiments. So I asked her um, when, when she was kind of uh, making a big mess in our living room so uh, to, 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 to get the key and open the door. And I gave her the task of uh, doing this within less than 10 trials. And if she would have been successful, she would need to clean up. So the incentive was set in some sense. She was running to the door and I was kind of expecting two possible outcomes. Either it's so simple that she would be doing it immediately or that she was, uh, would not be able to do it at all. The result was kind of astonishing to me. It was only seven trials, so obviously not a big data uh, issue, but uh, still seven trials and she was already five years old. Around the same time, um, there was the so-called DARPA Robotics Challenge running when uh, some of the most uh, prominent researchers gathered together close to, to LA and we basically tried to solve a challenge that uh, my, my daughter was able to do in, in, uh, with, uh, at the age of five and in seven trials. However, the best uh, robotic teams and the best robots in the world were not really able to do this on the same level. So there seems to be something that is uh, here a bit different between humans and robots. And I just want to give you an analogy why this seems to be a very complex thing. Um, and just by the concept of uh, mobility and manipulation. So Martin was uh, talking about mobility, so the autonomous driving assistant that helps you to, to stay in line while you're driving. Um, however, if you look at um, biological analogies, then it's kind of interesting that the concept of mobility, so moving from A to B without colliding uh, with the world is something that already single cell organisms have developed billions of years ago. So this seems to be a very simple ability to, to, to execute from a biological perspective. At the same time, the concept of manipulation, so using the tool hand, grasping the world, manipulating it, interacting with it, seems to be something that really took billions of years of 
of evolution and only primates are able to do this uh, on that level of complexity. And it seems to be the tool of our creativity, of our expression, also the, 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 the co-evolution of hands and, and the brain are kind of well-known concepts. And it's kind of giving us a kind of more humble uh, perspective on the concept of ma uh, manipulation and the abilities that humans have on that level. And this brings me a little bit to this kind of uh, distinction about what AI is, what is embodied AI, and what uh, what is really a robot, a little bit what Jeanette was referring to. Um, oh, I think, no, Martin was doing that. So when we look at the famous um, systems we all know, then the concept of disembodied AI, so a body without an AI is essentially consisting of a data receiver sender system that receives data, sends it to an algorithm, that then does the processing in order to give you some information back. If we go on the real world, then obviously we all know these devices like Alex and other uh, personal assistants, they essentially uh, record the data, that uh, the speech data, we send it into the cloud that the algorithm computes some results. And then in this sequential process, we actually get the feedback, the result of this process. So it's a purely sequential uh, question and answer process in terms of uh, systemic responses. However, if we go to the real world and physical uh, interaction, the difference in what we call embodied AI, so artificial intelligence with the body, is essentially that we don't only have a sending and, and response unit, but we actually have a so-called sensory motor body. And that sensory motor body is not only interacting with the world via data, but also via energy. So action and reaction. Obviously, this is what we call the laws of physics. So the presence of a sensory motor body induces ultimately the concept of interaction, which is an action and reaction process, a systemic process, as we call it. And obviously, if the body is interacting with the world, then the AI algorithm has also to interact with the sensory motor body. So we are talking about fully coupled processes from the algorithmic to the sensory motor body to the world that this agent, as we call it, interacts. And when we look at it, then obviously the sequential process is something that is much, much, much easier than the fully coupled uh, process that we see in the, uh, in the embodied AI discipline. And obviously, since embodied AI is a very interesting field, essentially the, one of the nicest representations of uh, AI systems with the body is what we call robotic systems. All right, however, if we talk about robots, then we all know also from the poll, we are going to lose all our jobs. So this is the famous Spiegel. It's kind of our uh, uh, weekly magazine that that uh, that um, is kind of famous in Germany, and I think it's also internationally a little bit known. So, but if you look at the cover uh, stories in 1964, 1978, and 2016, it was always the robots that were kind of responsible for taking away our jobs. In 1964, automation in Germany. In 1978, the computer revolution. However, we see a robot here. In 2016, you are fired, the robot's hand grasping you. However, it's not only the uh, typical jobs in manufacturing. However, if we talk about this, and we should also ask the question, where are all these robots that we're talking about? Interestingly, most of the robots that we see so far are behind fences. They are uh, doing spot welding and painting. Humans are only very seldomly uh, close. However, they are always kind of segregated from the robots by a safety fence, especially if we talk about these heavy positioning machines that barely have any kind of intelligence. So these are obviously not embodied AI systems. So what does an embodied AI really need? We talked about interaction, not only emotion. So obviously we need a sense of touch. This is one of the most crucial things that you need in order to develop a system that is able to interact with the world, that can be taken by the hand, that is safe in its interaction with the world. So you see here a robot with a, with a nail in its hands, and it's so sensitive that within milliseconds, in fact, 60 times faster than the human can do it, is able to detect and respond with reflexes, similar to what humans have, to a potential collision with the environment. So Isaac Asimov's first law, a robot may not injure a human being, implemented in real physical robots, something that has not been possible so far for a long time. And these robots now can work alongside humans. So they're not segregated anymore from, from humans, but they are becoming partners. They are becoming tools. So the hammer of tomorrow, you could say, nowadays, today, is the robot that you can teach, that you can show something that's able to execute skillful, dexterous tasks that go beyond simplistic, what we call positioning tasks. So they can help in assembly. They can actually make human workers um, be more effective. They can take over things that are dangerous, dull, 
and uh, and also the things that really make us so they actually make us make us um, um, uh, more effective in the way that that we are uh, being uh, that we are using these systems and in particular they are by definition still for many many years a tool that kind of make the work that we are doing at the moment maybe even better and, uh, than the work we have been doing before the years before the second thing that these systems need is obviously the ability to learn so machine learning ai is obviously highly related with the ability to learn however the ability of a embodied ai system to learn is unfortunately a little bit more complex because of the systemic nature i was explaining what you see here now is the first robot some years ago that we developed that was able to insert a peg into the hole just with a very very small pc the one that you see here just a 300 buck Bucks uh, PC that does the machine learning algorithms that are kind of inspired from the human and we don't need big data algorithms anymore because we basically encode the knowledge that we understand from human uh, and other primates to be able to grasp and interact with the world and, and learn with highly efficient machine learning algorithms, kind of skillful tasks to a certain extent. And the interesting thing is if you compare this to grown ups, so these are now three students of mine an ME student, a CS student, and, uh, and an electrical engineering student. And they all are able to do this, uh, what we call insertion test. This is kind of a very famous uh, reference problem we have in robotics called the peg and hole problem. And interestingly, they all are grown ups. They have opened up their eyes. The robots on the upper left is actually blind, but it's able to execute the test at the same speed as a grown up. So it's not as we saw with my little daughter. However, how about the key into the hole? So let's see what happens if we do the key into the hole. And obviously the big question is, if I tell a newborn robot, please insert the key into the hole, then obviously that robot is not yet able to do it. However, one of the questions that we also ask is obviously in a, in a kind of society of digital and network technology, as we are interacting today, the question could be, what happens if we kind of network, let these robots not only interact with us as humans, as our tool, but one human to n robots and let them teleoperate them all and interact and experience all kinds of diverse experiences. So they all do the different tasks with different keys. So they now try to learn multiple keys at the same time. But there's one thing that is special. They exchange the information simultaneously. And now let us take a closer look to the what we call digital twin of the system. That is the collective AI of all of these robots that kind of gathers all the information from the different robots and learns from failure and success how to intelligently and smoothly and nicely insert the key into the hole, not in, seven, not in five years and seven trials like my little daughter, but in fact, it was already in the first trial when the system was successful indeed. So by interconnecting and letting them exchange information instantaneously, these systems can actually speed up exponentially the information and the knowledge acquisition compared to what single agent systems such as us humans alone can do. So the concept of collaboration and interaction is speeding up uh, the, the concept of learning by exponential terms. Now these robots essentially have gathered this information of success and failure, send the information to the uh, robot in the front, and that robot is now able to execute the task that we saw uh, first. So essentially a newborn uh, robotic system is able to do this immediately. So here we can see the real system. I'm going to speed up a little bit so that I don't run out of time. And you see already in the first place, some of the systems, the green ones, have been successful. And here you can see some successful trials of essentially newborn robots, never having experience to interact with the world, able to take the key, insert it gently, and be able to then gather that knowledge and send it to the robot in the front, which you see here, that has not moved during the entire experiment. So the concept of collectivity of collective learning is able to learn, acquire information and skills exponentially faster than humans could do it in principle. Obviously, these are still very basic skills. However, the concept, I think, becomes clear. So this is a fully new effect that shows generalization ability in learning, network, and collectivity have on knowledge increase in general. So this is also a kind of an explanation, I guess, for our network society, showing that just kind of looking at the naive example of a single isolated being that cannot learn and generalize, so learns and forgets something. Let's do a very naive interpretation of what's going on here. And let's take the goal of accomplishing 10 to the power of five tasks, meaning 100%. And obviously such a system would need, if one task takes one hour, 100,000 hours, right? Linear increase, that's I guess very clear. 
However, if we now take the human example, we learn from, uh, from experience and we go faster, we become faster, we master certain tasks. And then at some point, we actually have a tipping point when the qualitative nature of the, uh, of the curve actually goes into this instantaneous uh, acquisition of knowledge and skills. And if we now kind of zoom in there, then it's kind of interesting that there is really this qualitative nature. At some point, we master a task. However, what have we seen so far over the last years is we could parallelize, we could do big data computing and so on and so forth. And let's have a look what happens if we now let many agents, many robots do the same thing. The interesting thing is there is no qualitative interaction. There is actually just a linear increase. So what does this tell us? We need to network the people. We need to exchange information. We need to be generous in knowledge exchange. So essentially have a collectivity to then again create a second tipping point that really now is what I call the collective learning effect. And this boils down all kinds of network systems. So starting from the single cell organism that always has to learn and repeat and obviously needs linear time in skill acquisition and in, in executing these tasks to the polymath that needs a lifetime on a logarithmic scale to acquire 100% of the knowledge to the collectivity of humans and machines that all together may be the solution to many of our problems today. And I think kind of showing that the interaction between humans and robots is the way to go for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sami. Uh, very, very good and interesting. And we will uh, get back to you in a while for questions. Uh, so to everybody following, please post questions in, in the chat that we can bring up uh, in the end. Um, and keep the conversation going in parallel to the, parallel to the talks as well. Uh, now we have our second speaker. So with us from outside of Boston, the USA, we have Dr. Kate Darling. Uh, Kate is a research specialist at the MIT Media Lab, where she works on how technology intersects with society with a particular interest in law, social, and ethical issues. For us, she's going to dive deeper into what the ethical and societal effects of robotic technologies are. So please welcome Kate Darling. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours. Hi, everyone. Just going to share my slides. All right. So I really love robots. I love robots more than I love spiked lemonade. Uh, and I always have. And when I first started working in robotics labs, I was really excited to get to see kind of the cutting edge technology that's out there. I mean, people like Sami are doing amazing, uh, very interesting work. Uh, but I also realized that if you go to these robotics labs um, expecting to find the robots that are about to take everyone's jobs and about to take over the world and kill us all, uh, you're going to be pretty disappointed. <laughs> so, you know, as, as Sami showed, uh, most of what our robots do right now is fall over. Um, you know, maybe some of them can turn a key in a door, but I guarantee you that most of those, if you throw a bucket of water over them, you'll be totally fine. Uh, don't don't feel too threatened yet. Uh, so jobs and robot overlords are two um, questions that are on a lot of people's minds these days, but they're not the only questions and they're not the questions that I'm most interested in when we talk about robotics. So here's something that I think is fascinating. There is a Japanese manufacturing company that has people working in a factory and the people come in in the mornings and they warm up their bodies for their day on the assembly line by doing these exercises. And the company will have their robots do the exercises with the people in order to be perceived more like colleagues and less as machines. That's kind of weird. I also think it's really interesting that in 2015, when Boston Dynamics released this video of their robot spot, um, everyone in robotics said, oh my gosh, that's amazing. It didn't fall over. And uh, some normal people had more negative responses to what was happening in the video. And it actually got to the point where uh, there was so much attention around this that PETA, the animal rights organization, was getting so many phone calls that they had to issue a press statement. And they didn't take it very seriously. They said, you know, it's not a real dog. But 
I think that there's something really interesting here because what I think is interesting about how we're interacting with robots is that people, despite all knowledge to the contrary, will um, treat robots consciously or subconsciously kind of like living things. Now, I was at a conference about a year ago uh, getting a spiked lemonade at the bar and I met this guy, let's call him Scott, because that was his name. And uh, he asked what I was interested in. And I said, I'm interested in the fact that despite all knowledge to the contrary, people consciously or subconsciously treat robots like living things. And Scott said, nah, I don't buy it. We talked for a long time. I couldn't convince him. His, Scott's position was, this is generational. You know, the new generation, as the Goethe Institute calls it, generation A, that is growing up with devices all around them. Uh, they're, you know, maybe, Maybe the silly people who like grew up with Star Wars are, are primed to do stuff like this, treat robots like they're alive. But the new generations, once robots are everywhere, are going to treat them just like any other device. And I couldn't convince him. So I think, yes, I think in part he's right. In part, we have this influence of science fiction and pop culture that primes us. We have the novelty of this technology like when a hitchhiking robot got beat up uh, five years ago and everyone is, was upset about that, maybe that was because of the novelty effect of never having seen a hitchhiking robot before. But there's also a part to this, to our perception of robots that goes a little bit deeper than that. Because we have this inherent tendency to anthropomorphize, to project human-like traits, qualities, behaviors onto non-humans. Um, we do this to animals, we do this to objects, um, even stuffed animals. Uh, we do this from a very early age. We do it in order to make sense of the world around us and interpret it, but also to relate to it because we're very social creatures. And another thing that we respond very strongly to in our brains is movement. So we are constantly scanning our environments and trying to separate things into objects and agents. Uh, and there's studies show that, you know, this, this evolutionarily uh, developed hardwiring really makes people project intent onto any autonomous movement in their physical space. And the thing about robots is that they are objects that move like agents. And so people tend to perceive even very simple robots as agents. This is the Roomba vacuum cleaner, not the most sophisticated robot in the world, roams around the floor in vacuums, but the fact that it is moving around on its own through the room with purpose causes people to name their Roombas. Over 80% of Roombas have names. Don't know the numbers for other vacuum cleaners. I guarantee you they're lower. People will feel bad for the Roomba when they get stuck in the curtains. People will send their, their Roombas in for repair. The company has all these stories of people sending their Roombas in and uh, they turn down the offer of a brand new replacement Roomba saying, no, we want you to fix Meryl's sweep and send her back to us. And the Roomba is just a disc. Uh, we also have a lot of more biologically inspired robots that really tap into this instinct even further. This is another Boston Dynamics robot. It's really hard to watch these things move and not feel like they have some sort of agency. They're very animal-like. And this is also something that can be designed intentionally. So social robotics is all about designing robots that are characters and that mimic movements and sounds and cues that we automatically subconsciously associate with states of mind. I first got really interested in this when I bought one of these. This is a toy called a Plio that came out in 2007. And it's a robot, it has all these motors and touch sensors and an infrared camera, and it has this tilt sensor so it knows what direction it's facing. And I would show it off to my friends and say, oh, hold it up by the tail, see what it does. Because this is what the Plio does when you hold it up by the tail. I don't think you'll be able to hear this, but you'll be able to see. So it's, you can't hear it, but it is crying. And what I noticed when I told my friends to do this, some of them would hold it up for a really long time and it started to bother me. And I would tell them to put it back down and say, okay, that's enough now. And then I would pet the robot to make it stop crying. So that was really interesting. Um, it kind of sparked a curiosity in me and fast forward a few years, this was years ago now, but it was very interesting. I did this workshop with my friend Hannes Gossel where we gave 
five groups of people. We gave each group one of these baby dinosaur robots. We had them name them and play with them and interact with them. And after about 45 minutes, we unveiled a hammer and a hatchet and we told them to torture and kill the robots. And it turned out to be super dramatic, much more dramatic than we expected it to be. People really refused to do it. Uh, we had to kind of threaten them th that we were going to destroy all the robots unless someone took a hatchet to one of them. And finally, someone volunteered and we kind of stood in a circle as he like brought the hatchet down on the baby dinosaur. And then there was this half joking, half serious moment of silence in the room for the fallen robot. So that was a really, really interesting day. This wasn't science. This was not a controlled experiment by any means, but it inspired some later research that I did at MIT with Palash Nandi and Cynthia Brazil using much more simple robots, using hex bugs. They move around like a little insect. And uh, we had people come in to the lab and smash them with mallets. And we were looking at correlations between their tendencies for empathy and their hesitation to hit the hex bug. And you know, it turns out that according to our results, if you're one of the people who likes to go to Westworld and, you know, shoot all the lifelike robots, you might score low on a test for empathic concern generally. So that was just a little study, but there's a ton of research in human robot interaction that shows that people respond to the cues that these lifelike machines give them. And we respond even if we know perfectly well that they're not real. Now, at the end of this conference where I met my lemonade friend, Scott, uh, we bumped into each other again. And he was like, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, maybe, maybe you were right. Because he had seen this demo at the conference of a dragonfly robot. It wasn't this one. This is some random rendering of one. But it looked similar. And it, would, it was flying around a room. And he said he had noticed the people watching it were just so transfixed watching this thing buzz around over their heads and he was like yeah i don't i don't know but like maybe we are built this way but i still don't buy it so we shook hands and we decided to come back to it in a few decades to see who was right um but the next few decades are going to be pretty interesting to watch because what's happening right now um is that robots are moving from factories, as Sami mentioned, they're you know, behind cages, behind walls, but now they're moving into more shared spaces as the technology improves into workplaces, households, public areas. So we have these machines that can sense and think, make autonomous decisions and learn, coming into spaces where they're interacting with people and they're not alive, but people sometimes treat them sort of like they're alive. And that's really important to understand because if we're trying to integrate the technology, we need to understand when and how people treat it differently than another device. And one of the reasons this is actually a cool thing is because it can be harnessed. There's already some really cool use cases in health and education for using social robots that rely on this emotional connection. Um, for example, there's some really promising research on using um, robots in engaging children on the autism spectrum in ways that we haven't been able to previously. Or there's the PARO, which is the therapeutic seal that's used in nursing homes with dementia patients. That's really cute and really kind of gives you the sense of nurturing something. And often when I tell people about PARO, they say, oh my gosh, Kate, that's so terrible. I can't believe we're giving people robots instead of human care. And it's I think PARO is a terrible replacement for human care. Don't get me wrong. That is not how this robot should be used. But I think that a um, common problem that we have in our conversations around robotics, not just social robotics, but generally, is that we're often comparing robots to humans and talking about them as a human replacement. But this analogy doesn't really make sense to me because artificial intelligence is so different in skills from human intelligence. Uh, I think other analogies would make so much more sense. And so, for example, the PARO actually isn't a replacement for human care. It is a replacement for animal therapy in contexts where we can't use real animals for a lot of reasons. But we can use the robots. They have a very similar effect. They lower people's blood pressure. They uh, cause oxytocin release. They've been able to use it as an effective alternative to medication to calm distressed patients. So some pretty cool uses for that. And in general, this animal analogy, you know, we've used animals for work, weaponry, companionship throughout history. And we've used them not because they do what we do, but because their skill sets are complementary to ours. And the 
the true potential of artificial intelligence and robotics in my mind is not to recreate what we already have unless you know maybe we're trying to save lives or uh, as sami said like the dirty dull dangerous work okay but in general the true potential here is to partner with this technology in what we're trying to achieve so i i totally agree with sami on that one and i think this animal analogy applies even further than just integration of robots in the workplace, I think it also applies socially, because if you think about it, throughout history, we've treated most animals like tools and products, and then some special animals we've given a status as our companions. And I think it's entirely plausible that we might start seeing the same thing with robots, where we treat most of them like tools and products, and then some as our companions and have more of a social relationship with them. Now, we know what Scott would say to this, and I have this to say to Scott, you know, Scott, maybe you're right. Maybe once Generation A is out there and robots are ubiquitous, maybe they are gonna treat robots just like any other device, but I just don't buy it. And if I'm right, then there are some questions that need to be answered sooner rather than later as we start integrating this technology. Is it okay for, soldiers to become emotionally attached to the robots that they work with, as has already started to happen, or is that dangerous? Can robots actually be used as an emotional support in war or crisis situations, just like horses were used in, in World War I? They initially started out as tools, they ended up being emotional support for a lot of the soldiers. That may sound ridiculous, but it sounded ridiculous for animals back in the day as well. Other questions like, is it okay for people to behave violently towards very lifelike robotic objects, or could that be desensitizing to violence in other contexts? Are companies or governments going to leverage this very persuasive social robot technology to manipulate people um, and coerce them? And how can we try through regulation or other methods to kind of curb some of the the dangers of, of people abusing us through this technology in a world of you know unbridled capitalism and also you know how can we lean into some of the positive effects of this in in health and education and really try to build social technology that benefits people so i think that the insights that we glean from human robot interaction are really interesting but also really important and one of the things i love most about it is that we're learning not just about how to integrate the technology better, we're also learning more about people. We're learning more about empathy and communication and in general, how we re relate to each other. So I will stop there and I look forward to questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, and also Sami for two great uh, talks. Uh, we have a little bit more than 15 minutes for, for questions. Um, and my colleague Jeanette will, will, will call out uh, those who, um, who can answer, ask the questions. But I will actually ask the first one. And it's a question for, for both of you, Sami and Kate. Um, so in a couple of weeks, we have a lesson on AI and the future of work. And work is something that you both mentioned in your, in your, in your talks. And I'm wondering if, if, I would, if I'm starting out my work career today, what, what strategies should I employ to surf this wave of robotics and automation instead of spending my time worrying about losing my jobs to it? Do you want to? I, mean, I could start. Um, so I think that despite the fact that the main potential of robotics is to assist us, I think there are certain things that can be automated that might be uh, done by humans today. Anything that's a very, very well-defined task within well-defined boundaries is something that can be automated. And so um, it, it's kind of industry specific how this is gonna affect different industries, but it's kind of like a very general what should you be watching out for as you enter the workforce is maybe moving towards the skills that you know, machines aren't good at doing, anything that requires context or concepts or um, you know, any you know, human to human communication. I think that those, that's still a pretty good bet. If I would, uh, I would answer this question, I guess my, 
<clears throat> my answer is a little bit um, along the lines of uh, sure that's a, that's a, it's probably a good bet and it makes a lot of sense. Um, I just think that it's important to um, to really see that this is um, a kind of new new type of technology in a way, right? So it's not just uh, we are kind of entering a new phase of. Of, of machines that really show a certain type of complexity that is beyond, you know, the typical techie oriented uh, uh, things. So it's not only anymore for technologists and, and people who like to play around with, with, with technology, but it actually affects people's lives on a broad scale beyond, you know, I mean, the, the usual uh, level, I would say. So I think what is an extremely important um, um, at least take home message for, for the, that, that I, I, I was able to gather from many of the projects I've been doing is that we as technologists need to really think purpose-led. I mean, we should be purpose-led. We should really think much, much clearer in the long-term shot. And if people want to, you know, change the way that the world works, I mean, look at the, the wonderful tool that we have uh, the pleasure to, 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 to kind of come together with, Zoom. Uh, next to all the other tools. I mean, this has been developed by technologists that probably did not think that this would be one of the key contributions to bring people together in a in a phase of, of I mean, otherwise entire separation. So um, I, I think it's it's really the yeah I, I really believe that that it's it's a great um, uh, path one could take, and it's also coming with a great responsibility in the sense that uh, it's. Uh, the things we, we're doing might really tremendously affect everybody's lives. So this should be very consciously in the in the decision, in the choices. Okay, so we should we should all be students of yours and and, and become robotic engineers. That's the safest bet, maybe. Uh, but now I'm going to hand over to uh, to Shanet, uh, and she will uh, bring out some more questions from the audience. Yes, there have been a lot of very philosophical questions. So can robots be aware of their existing? Can they build up emotions? Can they have emotions or can robots become aware of themselves? So there are many uh, questioners. Maybe we start with Fabio Farvan or whoever else will speak. Can you unmute yourself? No, doesn't seem to. First question was uh, mine. If robots are aware of its existing, I mean conscience. Oh, it's going to be, and I know they are not now, but if they can learn, maybe they can learn that they exist so they would fight to survive or something like that. I mean, in the future, if you do this, this same uh, experience that Kate did, the, the, the robot the dinosaur can run away or fight back. I don't know. It's because I, I am you... writing a story about this. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I would prompt you to also think about this in terms of animals who do, we believe, I mean, we don't have a good definition of what consciousness is, which is like the the main problem, but with animals, you know, we do a lot of experiments with them and we don't seem to care and they, de they don't seem able to be able to, to fight back in that way. So um, as you're thinking about this question, think about how we've treated other non-humans uh, who, who have developed or have consciousness in that sense as well. But I'll let Sami answer the technical question of programming consciousness into machines. Oh, great! Thank you for the for the uh, for the, the pretty hard question. So um, I, I must say I, I I pretty much agree with many of the things that Kate was just saying, and and she was saying something very important um, in the beginning. That was um, we don't have a good definition of what you're asking, right? Uh, about so what is conscious? What is the self? That I mean, a very famous uh, polymath like like Leibniz was thinking about uh, the existence and the the body and the soul, and um, that's always a problem if you if you ask these specific questions. And you know, as a as a human, I would say that's my my uh, human answer is 
no way because if I mean at least not that as, as long as I'm building them because I'm I'm just not able to probably. Um, but I really think that um, you know the idea of building a machine, you know, you can do the thought experiment of entering it, uh, in a little bit like a in building a, a machine. You you walk into it, you look at it. I mean, it functions. It does something. You disassemble it. There is no consciousness. There's nothing, right? And you build it together, and voila, it, it functions again. So if this is the uh, narration and the, the narrative and the, and the interpretation that we want to take, my answer would be certainly no. If you ask me define what we mean by that in technical terms, then you can call it whatever you like. We may, we may call it consciousness. We could also call it, I don't know, fridge. And we would implement what we just defined to be consciousness or fridge. So, and I'm, I'm giving this a little bit jokey answer because it's really in technology and science, we need to define very precisely what we mean by that. But to maybe also give you the technical answer to that, there is the concept of the self, right? So a, um, a robot that has a body, an embodiment, needs to understand that it, that it has a body. But understand is the word, meaning we have developed a program that has a part in its, store, in its, in its uh, storage mechanism that is the representation of the, of the physics of the body. And then it has to have this understanding of interaction, right? Action and reaction have to be made uh, algorithmically readable, uh, meaning mathematics in the end. Um, and, and then to bring the, the kind of fighting back into the game, I mean, of course, we, we can implement motivation into the systems, implicit or explicit uh, motivation. Um, and then obviously there's an action and reaction, right? Like with any interaction. And this reaction could cause uh, many responses. And this is why a lot of our work is really about kind of regulating these reactions. Um, so I think it's really about definition and being as specific as we can to not confuse concepts of humans and concepts of machines. I mean, a mannequin is not a human. It just looks like a, like a human, right? Still, there is nothing in it that uh, so the ghost in the shell is missing in a way. so we have another interesting question Thank from you from madulika matsunda i hope i pronounce it right about studying a robot culture it's for kate maybe you can speak up madulika Oh, maybe she has left already. There were also two questions about uh, the replacement of teachers and how can AI be integrated into the education of young students? Maybe one of the questioners will speak out. Hello, um, I'm, I'm Nuda. I'm a biology teacher for middle and high school students. Um, this is really an interesting topic um, because I know that uh, once robots um, in the future, there, there will be replacement of uh, many, many jobs. But at the same time, a lot of jobs will be created. So with respect to educational systems, um, how will the artificial intelligence or robots be integrated? Like, uh, it would be cool for me as a teacher to teach um, with the assistance of a, of a robot, uh, maybe hologram or to show 3D structure because I'm in the scientific field, you know, uh, biology and stuff. So uh, what, what are the uh, insights about um, education and uh, teaching? Or will there be only integration of uh, certain uh, maybe jobs or, um, I don't know, tasks? but not a full replacement. So your thoughts about this, please? Well, I think there are two questions here. There's what will happen, what's likely to happen and what should happen. So if, if the question is, you know, should robots be replacements for teachers? Absolutely not. Like even as we advance the technology, I don't think that that's really, again, the potential to recreate some, a skill that we already have. But there is a lot of potential, I think, for robotics to assist people in doing their jobs better. And so one example that I know of that has been researched a little bit in the educational space is that um, Brian Scazzolati at Yale, his group has done some work around what 
challenges teachers are facing in the classrooms. And, you know, one challenge needs to be solved politically, which is that they don't get enough one on one time with the students and can't help them individually. Um, one challenge that robots might be able to help with, though, is that some teachers, so they did, they did, they worked with some teachers who teach um, English to non native speakers. And they said they were struggling with the fact that the kids didn't want to make mistakes in front of others. And they didn't even want to make mistakes one on one with the teacher because it was embarrassing. And without making mistakes, the teachers couldn't assess, you know, what where the kids needed help. But they figured out that, you know, introducing a robot into like a more holistic program, having the kids sometimes interact with a robot, they were they were more willing to make mistakes with the robot, because there's not this idea of being judged. So I don't, I don't think that a robot is a good replacement for a teacher, but I do think that as part of a more holistic curriculum, robots could be introduced as tools and could have something to offer. And that's how I would hope that they would be used as well. <laughs> you never know. It, 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 they, again, these are choices that we are making as a society as to whether we're using robots as replacements or supplements. And, uh, you know, part of that is on how is the technology developed, but part of that is also on you know, are schools underfunded? Do they need something to replace a teacher that's not as good as a teacher? Are they going to turn to technology to do that? That's unfortunate, but that's also a larger political question than just a question about the technology itself. Okay, I have another question from Olha Zaldeska about the safety uh, uh, from robot human interactions. So maybe you want to ask these questions, Olha? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, actually, it is uh, quite an intricate question, and uh, it will be very curious about the uh, opinion of the specialist as for this. Uh, there is so much uh, to be said, and there has been so much fiction written and discussions. So maybe... <laughs> It could be there. There is a tendency or the view that is already formed and followed by uh, the speakers today. Yeah, sure. I mean, I can, if you, if you like, Kate, I can uh, take a first shot. Okay. And uh, uh, since at least I have an opinion, let's put it this way. My dissertation was was called. Towards safe robot approaching Asimov's first law. So I feel a little mm -hmm. bit obligated to, to say at least uh, one or two things about that. Um, it's a pretty important question. It has always been an important question with any machinery. So regardless whether you talk about a car, a plane, uh, classic industrial robots, um, driver assist assistance, what, what uh, Martin was saying in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And, and there's, it's always, uh, the first question is always, uh, who's responsible, right? That's in the real world, right? Not, not yes. a philosophical or ethical um, question, but really on legal terms. Everything boils down to who's responsible. That's unfortunately, unfortunately, one of the core questions we have to, to deal with uh, in many directions. Um, and I think just out of necessity, safety is always, at least if you go to the real world, not only mm -hmm. stay in the labs and in the research uh, environment, mm -hmm. as soon as you go out to the real world, um, safety is prime. And without safety, you are in legal trouble, right? I mean, let's, let's be clear on that, especially if it's a, it's a real machine that is potentially dangerous, meaning that if you didn't do your job as an engineer, if you didn't uh, do the, uh, the right safety developments, um, but this is just a kind of a, a kind of um, a legal aspect. At the same time, there is a, a huge um, body of work all over the, the world over the last 20 years that has targeted for making increasingly autonomous systems aware. So now we're coming to this concept of the, the of two questions mm -hmm. before about the self mm -hmm. and the motivation and the causality of, of uh, uh, a system's own actions. Um, to, to understand how can robots reason uh, even about yeah. uh, potentially uh, unsafe situations and increase safety. So there is a lot of body of work starting from making a system from a design point of, uh, from a design standpoint as safe as possible, meaning extremely light, right? I mean, flexible, mm -hmm. compliant, sensitive. That's why the sense of touch is so important because if I crush your hand when I'm shaking your hand, 
I'm probably not a pretty safe robot. So I need to have this dexterity and, and tactility. So this is kind of an embodiment level. And then comes more and more of this uh, abstract mm -hmm. um, reasoning. And, and this is a lot of work that is existing there. However, I must, uh, I must also say that um, bringing them to the real world, meaning applications, products that reach you guys, is still a large hurdle. So you can see this in cars. I mean, just a lane uh, uh, system is already a big challenge, right? I mean, we all saw the, some incidents and, and accidents also with autonomous cars. And I tried to give you a little bit of the understanding that mobility is not the same thing as manipulation. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and there's increasing complexity about that. So the answer is, it's a lot of our work is centered around safety, especially because we have bodies that might hurt humans and we try to design them as, as safe as possible. There is even entire standards dealing with that. And this is a huge and important uh, step to be done. And this also kind of relates to the question that I was asked before about education. It's also about educating people to be able to understand robots, to, to, to learn to interact and use them. So kind of driver's lessons, uh, of, I mean, robot driver's licenses in some sense. I mean, only if you're, if you're educated, if you know how to use these systems, then true safety can be achieved in a way. Right? It's, it's like with any tool, I guess. Yeah, yeah thank you. Enough. Sounds very soothing. Thanks for the question. So I think we have to come to an end. Unfortunately, there are so many questions left. Um, but Martin, you wanted to do the poll one more time. Um, may I ask one question? Yes, it's it's. We so w w what we're gonna do? We're gonna leave the everybody. We're gonna leave the session open. But since it's now six p.m., uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. Um, so, but there will be time for those that want to sort of hang out and and keep the conversation going afterwards. Um, in, in, in doing so. But I've now launched uh, the poll again, and it's going to be interesting to see if we have any different answers from when we started. Uh, and Jeanette, maybe you want to, to wrap up as people are answering the questions again. Yes, I will. So at the end of our second, or our third lesson already, <laughs> I want to thank Kate and Sami, you, Martin, my colleagues, and all of you that you joined the lesson. And I would like to draw your attention to the upcoming couch lessons. Uh, about AI and ethics, AI and creativity, AI and the future of work. And after this couch lesson, seven more will follow at least. Next time we will speak about AI and climate change with Victor Gallas from the Stockholm Resi Resilience Center, with Lynn Kark, co-chair of Climate Change AI, and with Sims Winterspoon from DeepMind. So please join us again next Wednesday. Tell your friends about the couch lesson and share them with our followers, your followers, and you can find more detailed information on our website, goethe.de slash couch lessons. And if you're interested in the topic uh, of climate change and AI, please join us next Wednesday. Thank you. And I can just say that the, the results from the poll are actually quite uh, similar to, to the very, uh, when we started, uh, maybe there is a slight change in that in, in the first question, will robots replace humans? Uh, more of us are now saying no, never. Um, so I don't know if that's a positive or a negative thing, but that's at least what we think. So thank you very much to our speakers and, and have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And, and if not, that's that's fine as well. I'm gonna see if we can self-manage it this in some way. Uh, maybe not, and 
I'm now sharing the results of the, the second poll as well. We can see the results. So if nobody wants to speak, maybe we should just leave it. <laughs> and we wish you a nice day, evening, whatever <laughs> your time zone is. And uh, yeah, we hope you will join us again. <laughs>